Hey there, everyone. Welcome to this Tuesday edition of The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny and warm Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the market action using the best practices of technical analysis. We're going to talk about market conditions. We're going to talk about a heavy earnings week, some of the big tech leadership names reporting after the close today. We'll look at some of the charts that are on the move going into earnings, some of the names probably that are going to be moving quite a bit here in the next, uh, the next session or two. Also sitting down with a uh, living legend, Ralph Acampora, the godfather of technical analysis, is here in our, uh, in our offices in uh, Redmond with a fantastic chart that he has donated to uh, Stock Charts. We'll have some comments from uh, Ralph later in the show. Also, some of his thoughts on the market, pretty constructive here. Now, when we think about that, it's all about the market conditions as defined by price. So with that in mind, let's look at the prices of major assets as we go to our market recap and focus on how the uh, charts have evolved over the course of the day here. You know, it's interesting as I was looking, preparing for the show, looking at our market dashboard, uh, you know, I was going through these first three charts and we're gonna zoom in in a moment, but just wanted to show you the Dow. Here's the last two days. So look at today's session. Here's the Dow sort of steadily moving higher. Here's the S&P essentially flat for the day. There's the NASDAQ composite drifting lower through the course of the trading session. Right there, I think you know most of what you need to know about the conditions through the course of today's session. It was basically about value over growth. Some of the beaten down sectors that have not been doing particularly well, things like energy and staples and even materials, outperforming the FANG sectors that have been at the top of the leaderboard for quite some time. Let's look at how the numbers actually played out. The S&P 500 essentially flat from yesterday's close, finishing the day around 49 at 25. The Dow up about a third of a percent. Again, that's driven by those value-oriented uh, sectors that are more heavily uh, represented in the Dow as opposed to the S&P. And then as that composite down about three quarters of a percent, uh, just around 15,500. Mid caps, small caps all in the red, and the S&P 600 small cap index down about a half a percent. The VIX drifting lower. So it's interesting, uh, you know, again, when we think about, you know, rotation versus a change of market uh, phase, uh, two very different things, right? When investors are rotating from one sector to another, probably the volatility remains relatively low, generally speaking, would be my general way of, uh, of thinking. And that's kind of what happened today, right? The VIX actually drifting a little bit lower, still above 13, around 13.3. So we're in the low teens, we're still in a low volatility environment. The reason why we look for the VIX to uh, be a sign of something more significant happening in terms of more of a risk off rotation uh, and more of a danger sign would be the VIX pushing higher because that's when investors are not just rotating to other equities, they're kind of getting out, they're selling aggressively. That causes volatility to spike and that's what will often cause uh, the VIX to push higher and that's why higher VIX tends to coincide with lower uh, risk assets, particularly our, uh, our growth oriented benchmarks. Looking at the interest rate environment, kind of mixed, to be honest with you, the long bond yield and the 10-year yield uh, drifting lower a little bit. The 10-year yield, which is the main data point we tend to focus on on the yield curve, right around 4.06%, so just below 4.1%. The five-year yield moving up to but just slightly, still remaining right around that 4% level. The short end of the yield curve still very elevated, so we do still have an inverted yield curve. We've had an inverted yield, for, yield curve for quite some time. Uh, it's so funny, and I, I, and I find when we... When, we, uh, when you look at uh, commentary and market strategy related to the yield curve and the inversion of the yield curve, I have read plenty of, uh, of content suggesting that the inverted yield curve has been a very good predictor of market tops and recessionary periods, really, uh, because that inver inverted yield curve represents uh, a lack of optimism about future economic growth. We're probably heading into a slowdown type of period which is why um, an inverted yield curve has been, you know, before most recessionary periods, uh, you've had an inverted yield curve. Market bulls tell you that doesn't matter at all and that this is different and that we're gonna have a soft landing Goldilocks kind of experience and the markets are gonna go higher. There will be no recession even though the yield curve has been uh, inverted. I tend to be more of a simple purist. I see a pattern that has been repeated and I tend to assume that that sort of pattern is probably gonna be valuable again. So an inverted yield curve, I think, uh, tells you that recession is not a word that we, uh, we can cross off our list of terms we may be talking about through the course of 2024. I think it'll probably come up a lot more than uh, markables may want. Dollar index, not too much of a change from yesterday's close. We'll move right on to the commodity space. Crude oil prices moving slightly higher. Gold and silver essentially flat for the day. In a lot of ways, you're getting kind of a quiet period. This is one of those weird 
um, you know, Fed meetings because it's right in the midst of earnings season. I'm talking the heat of it. As I mentioned on yesterday's show, 20% about of the S&P 500 uh, companies reporting earnings this week. So you have the Fed meeting with, which if it was kind of a normal week, we would all be focused on the Fed meeting today and tomorrow. Tomorrow is where we have the, uh, any update on uh, Fed funds target rate, and we're expecting uh, no change, but especially focused on Powell's comments about an outlook for the uh, economy, uh, an outlook for Fed policy changes and what that might mean, thinking about what it might mean for uh, the Fed to be lowering rates through the course of uh, 2024 and when that first rate drop may, uh, may occur. But the fact that this is happening in the midst of big time earnings, a bunch of the magnificent seven stocks are reporting. So the, the Fed meeting is one of a number of things all uh, happening. Jobs numbers later this week, of course, uh, something that could potentially move the markets as well. So commodities, generally speaking, kind of a quieter day, no significant moves, except crude oil prices doing a little bit better and uh, energy stocks doing well uh, also. Cryptocurrencies, we have Bitcoin up to around 46, uh, sorry, 43,630, we'll call it, it's up about three quarters of a percent from the end of the 24-hour period yesterday. Ether price is just below 2,400, that's up about 3%. You can see the remainder of the top 10 coins overall kind of mix, a little more red than green, but Bitcoin and Ethereum really moving higher, and Bitcoin bouncing off of that big round number of 40K, it's bumped up about almost 10% since hitting that uh, low here recently. Finally, looking at the sectors, and again, it's, it's such a pleasure to have Ralph Akampura in our office, had lunch uh, with him and was talking about uh, just general market conditions, what sort of names he's looking at. It was funny, uh, you know, a week ago or a couple weeks ago, I would have thought we were talking all about the FANG stocks, right, the Magnificent Seven. We were talking about financials. We were talking about insurance companies. We were talking about uh, industrials, consumer staples that he was mentioning a couple times. This is where you're seeing renewed influx of, uh, of optimism, I would, uh, I would argue. So today, the XLF up one and a quarter percent, energy up one percent, consumer staples number three up 0.6 percent. These are all, you know, staples pretty more, much more a, a pure defensive play, but the rest of these really more value-oriented plays, uh, so very different look than what we've seen in uh, really recent months from the uh, equity markets. On the downside, you have real estate, technology, communication services, all down with uh, real estate leading the way lower. But two of those represent pretty big uh, market cap, right? Technology and communication services. So if you're wondering why the NASDAQ is down while the Dow is up, there's your answer. The biggest weights are, uh, are down the most, and that'll, uh, that'll do it. Continuing on with our market recap, let's just look at a daily chart of the S&P 500. Sort of a long and strong, more of the same type of move. Uh, most of the days in the last two weeks have made a new, uh, a higher high than the previous day. There's only one or two days out of the last two weeks that have not uh, actually done so. So that is certainly a sign of optimism, of continued upward pressure. The S&P 500 uh, right around 49.25 at the close. So yesterday we finally got about 4,900 for the first time. We're very close to that 5,000 level. And, and uh, again, I'm, I'm drawn to uh, thinking about uh, Ralph Akampura writing legendary reports like Dow 7,000, Dow 10,000, S&P 5,000, Almost a reality. So if you have that on your bingo card in you know, 2009, good job. You're all, we're almost there. But really, it represents a really consistent upswing for stocks and, and the leadership names, those growth names, continuing to push higher. So we are in that sort of uncomfortable position, I would say, where as a trend follower, the market is very constructive in that we keep making higher highs. We keep making higher lows. We've recently consolidated and have resolved that to the upside, the uh, moving averages are both sloping upwards and the prices at the top. That's a bullish trend by any definition. The, the downside are that breadth of conditions, you know, in some ways still overly optimistic, um, momentum still, uh, you know, excessive, right, with the RSI above 70. And again, that doesn't necessarily mean that the uptrend is over. It usually suggests we're at the later stages of this little tactical rally, probably due for a bit of a pullback. And I'm wondering if that coincides not surprisingly with earnings this week. Big tech companies, big communication names uh, report earnings a little lighter, maybe lower their outlook. Stocks get dinged. That will draw our benchmarks down very, very quickly. So in the case of that happening, I would always encourage you, you know, sort of start with the right part of the chart and look to the left. Think about what levels stand out to you. Note how the 50-day moving average is currently right around 4,700. That lines up beautifully with this consolidation zone, which means 
if and when we do roll over, that would be the immediate levels I would be looking at. 4,800 is the breakout level, so that's probably the initial level of support I would look for. But this 47 to 4,800 range, the 50-day is right there. That's kind of a good back of the envelope. You know, if we get a brief pullback, I wouldn't be surprised if we get back to retest that uh, sort of breakout range. So keep an eye on that level, if and, and more, more like when we, uh, we actually do get a meaningful pullback here. I mentioned the financial sector. A lot of the names, uh, you know, kind of getting it done today uh, in the financial sector. The XLF up about one and a quarter percent, leading the markets higher, followed by energy. You can see the XLF making a new 52-week high. And what's really impressive is breaking out of this, you know, big sideways period. The weekly chart may even actually tell this story a little better, right? So you have the rally off of the 2020 low. You can see in late 2021, the XLF's making a new high, looking pretty strong. The first half of 2022, quite weak, but then the second half of 22 and much of 2023, really more range bound. And you can draw a big rectangle around this period to see that financials were essentially treading water, right, in a basing pattern, which is a sort of a rectangular pattern on the chart. Something changed here in the fourth quarter of last year as the markets rallied off of that October low. You can see that the financial sector popping higher and continuing to push on to where we're at today. So the daily chart really showing that strength. I think the weekly chart really shows you this, you know, uh, this drop in the first half of 22, the sideways period that was in place for more than a year, and then this rally that we've not now experienced. Now, to hit on some of the names in the financial sector, and, and really for the remainder of this uh, time, we'll, we'll talk about some individual names here uh, given uh, earnings season, but progressive is one of those Charts that has just gone consistently up and to the right. This is a weekly chart. Say again, a weekly chart of Progressive, an insurance company. Look at how solid this looks consistently. And this is through the COVID lows. This is through the uh, 2022 sell-off. This is through all the uncertainty that we've experienced in the last six or seven years. The stock's just been going up, consistently going up. And what's interesting to me is it really doesn't matter to me what group it's in, right? When you say an insurance company looks like this, you probably be like, wait, hold on. Is that like it looks more like a technology company, some sort of, you know, great growth stock that's just gone higher. This is progressive. It's property and casualty insurance. But you can see that the trend overall is very positive. And a weekly chart uh, like PGR reminds me of the value of technical analysis to help us focus on which stocks are actually working, not why they work, why they should work, whether they should work or not. Whether they're actually going up is what's most important. Price is king. Price is going up, continuing to, uh, to go higher here. Now, going back to some daily charts, you have American Express gapping above resistance, pulling back and popping higher. In the last week, we've had a nice uh, sort of gap higher. And then what's always interesting after you have a price gap is what happens in the subsequent days, right? In the next day or two, do you see additional buyers come in? Because Progressive was at 187, 188, and all of a sudden the next day it opens at 192 and closes up above 200. The fact that buyers, additional buyers are coming in, Wanting to pay more and more for the stock tells you about the longer-term optimism, right? These are investors really uh, looking for longer-term improvement and uh, looking for opportunities here. So good breakout, uh, good breakout there. Nomura, obviously a, uh, a Japanese bank in the investment services group is how we have it uh, bucketed. Again, just a nice breakout of a basing pattern, higher highs, higher lows. Now, are these stocks overbought? They are. Would I expect a pullback at some point? I absolutely would. But is the trend overall still very much in play? Absolutely. Higher highs and higher lows are the story there. Citigroup, right? Uh, you know, a big sort of classic uh, U.S. bank. You can see, again, sort of this deterioration on the left third of the chart, this big sideways basing pattern. And look at how this stock has reverted back to the, uh, to the upside. You know, we had a question. I forget what stock I was looking at, but I showed uh, a chart like Citigroup, and I put the underscore to do uh, unadjusted data. Just as a reminder, the reason why I do that is when you're looking at a stock like Citigroup, our uh, data by default is adjusted data, meaning every time a company reports a dividend, you adjust all the historical data. And that's a common practice in the, uh, in the industry, uh, in market data platforms, because when you're looking at the trend over time, stocks will often have that quarterly gap if it's a dividend pair. So the stock will gap down. It has nothing to do with investors getting nervous or any sort of behavioral implication. It's just because the company paid out part of the value of that stock in the form of a dividend, so the price has to get cut down. So what we do is we adjust the historical data, and this is called an adjusted data set. But if you want to look back in time and see where the stock actually traded at a point in time, and this only really mean, has meaning with higher dividend pairs. It has like a two, three plus percent 
uh, dividend yield, then what you might want to do is put an underscore before the ticker. What that does on the stock charts platform is it unadjusts the data, meaning it takes all those dividend adjustments away. And now you're looking at where Citigroup actually traded at these different points in time. Now we do still just adjust for splits. So just so you know, that's one uh, adjustment we would make, but very few people, if anyone actually show a split on a chart, it doesn't really help and doesn't really mean a whole lot uh, from, a, from a technical perspective. So when we look at the unadjusted data, look at the resistance from January, look at how that lines up with this uh, breakout attempt at the beginning of this year, we pulled back to the breakout level and now we're following through to the upside. Citigroup up over 5% today. Now to finish off our market recap, we have to talk about earnings and there's some meaty technology names and uh, communication services names represented just today after the close. AMD, one of the largest semiconductor stocks, AMD and Nvidia, sort of the two, the two big ones. AMD down three and a quarter percent going into earnings today. You're gonna notice in a moment, uh, Apple, if we have time to get to it, also down today. So I'm a little bit concerned, some of these big uh, names reporting earnings actually coming down, going into the earnings report, suggests some not so much optimism or some profit taking going into these uh, earnings reports. And it could be just investors taking some bets off the table because earnings can be an uncertain event. And if you're caught on the wrong side of it, it can be pretty painful. You don't want to give back all of these uh, previous gains. So look at this beautiful pattern of higher highs and higher lows. Maybe we're just in a pullback phase. Keep an eye on some of those previous swing lows. That 50-day moving average is all the way down 30 points lower around uh, 140, uh, 141. But just coming out of the overbought region today, Microsoft also reporting uh, after the close. You can see this just stepwise motion, right? The resistance in July, we broke out. We retested that resistance, lo or that resistance level now becoming support. We bounce off of the 50-day moving average with the RSI right around 45. We've now made a, uh, a new swing high. Once again, overbought usually implies to me we're sort of at the end of, uh, toward the end of this up move, look for a bit of a pullback. But overall, the longer term trend is still uh, quite constructive. Alphabet, another leading name we've highlighted many times. Again, this basing pattern here breaking out uh, above resistance. This hammer candle may be a little hard to see, but that's that little uh, candle there, that uh, swing low, where we came up and closed near the highs. From there, we've ro rotated higher. Alphabet's still overbought here, just slightly as we go into the close and coming up to their uh, earnings announcement. But all of these names, again, the consistent pattern with those last three, AMD, Microsoft, uh, Alphabet, they've had really good runs already. They have long-term, very constructive patterns. They are overbought and just starting to come out of that overbought region going into an earnings release. I'm interested and, uh, and probably anticipating more pullback than anything uh, around earnings, and maybe we have a reset uh, to go higher. Just to wrap up our market recap, Apple's actually reporting later this week, but I do want to note it has stalled out, unable to get above $200 a share, now selling off today another 2%. This is as, again, some of these big names are, uh, are reporting earnings. So interesting to see how the companies and the stocks look going into earnings. Always important to look at the charts after the earnings release, so tomorrow's session, to see how investors are treating that new price cap. Do you see additional buyers or sellers coming in? And see what that can tell you about the overall trend and uh, configuration of these, uh, of these technical uh, charts. That's it for our market recap. Quick uh, announcements before we bring on a fantastic guest, Ralph Akinpora, uh, and uh, get to, uh, to the announcement here. Uh, we'd love to hear from you, right? We have some great questions we received in our, uh, in our mailbag. So many thoughtful questions. We did an all-mailbag episode end of last week, and it was a lot of fun really getting into some of the nuances of technical indicators and market behavior and how to think about stocks in rotation. So keep the questions coming. Our email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We're on X at Final Bar SCTV, and on our YouTube channel, of course, just drop a comment below the video that you're watching. We would certainly love to hear from you. We'll hope to answer one of your questions in our next mailbag show. I sat down a little earlier with Ralph Akinpour, again, a legend in the, uh, in the financial industry, literally taught the street how to do technical analysis, myself and many others included. He's actually here in our offices in Redmond, hanging up a, uh, a chart that he's donating to stock charts. You're going to see in our interview the chart in the background. It's just an amazing piece of market history. It's a uh, chart, hand-drawn chart from the 1970s, capturing the 1974 low all of that negative sentiment and the rotation to a bullish sentiment that really led to the 1983 breakout where the Dow finally broke above 1,000. So here's my conversation earlier with the great Ralph Akinpora. 
All right, what a pleasure, everyone, to sit down with one of my mentors, really a legend in the technical analysis community in the financial industry, Ralph Acampora. Ralph, welcome to the office here in Redmond. It's so good Thanks. to have you here. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for inviting me. No, it's great to see you as always, but especially you know this week, you're in the process of hanging up a legendary chart of market history. Yes. Here now in the stock charts office, can you briefly share with us yes. what is this and why is this hanging here now? Well, this chart is over 50 years old. Yeah. And it hung in my chart room at Kidder Peabody. And I uh, had a staff of people that we would maintain this chart, which is eight feet high, about 22 feet long, and had four walls at this. So you can imagine how big the war room was. Right. <laughs> and uh, it was a wonderful experience, you know, just maintaining the data. And I had a whole staff doing it. Yeah. And uh, we would sit down after a day of doing all the charting, and then we'd spend uh, our lunch hour just look, walking around the walls and talking about the about the market. Soaking it all yes. in. But we were a day late. So you guys are online. You got it minute <laughs> by minute. I had to do it the day later. To well, look at the it's 2024. We yeah. get instant gratification now yeah. as, uh, as investors. But, yes. you know, it's interesting. And this period in market history that we're oh, featuring now, it's 1970s, oh, one right. of the most significant lows in market history a time when breadth conditions were so incredibly negative. Yes. When you look back now, oh, during yes. that period, what was the sentiment like as an oh. analyst, as a strategist? Oh, what did wow. it feel like on the street at that time? Oh, it was horrible. Yeah. Right. And it's, well, it started in 1973 when the market was peaking out. Yeah. Then you had the Yom Kippur War. Then the Arabs had the oil strike. And, yeah. they, and, and, the, and the market just collapsed. It dropped 45 percent. If you look over my shoulder, you'll see a lot of green. Right. Green on all those indicators mean you're oversold. Really oversold. Yeah. Right. So green means it's good, right? Yeah. But if you stay in green a lot, then it's not good. You know. <laughs> and you can see, but months and months and months, we yeah. were in deep oversold conditions. And market, didn't, if it rallied, it rallied for a couple of days. But yeah. So the wall colors on the wall really help you. And if you look again, you'll see there's a patch of red yep. years later. And that was when we came out, out, out of, of that. And we had a good bull move for a while. Can you talk about what that was like? Obviously, conditions were so negative for so long. And then all of a sudden, things started to improve. Yes. But it took quite a while. I mean, 1982, oh. 83, first time the Dow kind of went back above oh, 1,000. Yeah. Yeah. How, I mean, talk about that transition oh. and what convinced you finally that oh. the market was constructed. Well, that's the great story because uh, <laughs> I like to tell the story for the first 12 years of my, my being in the business. Everybody had these long faces Mark, <laughs> so because we were stuck in a wide trading range, a right. low of 500 and a high of uh, not quite a thousand. And we just couldn't get it at a trading range. Yeah. And then I think Ronald Reagan dropping uh, interest rates and uh, cutting Cutting that, and all of a sudden the market started to recover, and that's the period you're talking about, yeah. the early '80s. Yeah. But on this wall is most of that period that we're talking about, the '70s. Pretty challenging. Yeah. Period. So you had this wide trading range. You wrote a legendary report, Dow mm -hmm. 7000. When we came to visit you in in Minnesota a couple yes. of years ago, you showed us like the you know the images of that of that yeah. report. Can you talk about what that report was and what that meant really for your career? That was yeah. a you know it was a yeah. defining moment. I feel like. Well, let me let me go back to the beginning of the Market Technicians Association. The sure. First evening dinner meeting we had was in 1970, and wow. sitting next to a man who was a legend in his time, uh, and he. He, he said, he, Ken Ward was his name. Yeah. This is 1970. Ken was close to 80 years old. That wow. meant he lived through every bull and bear market up to the, that night in the 20th century. So I leaned over to him. I said, Mr. Ward, sir. I said, what was the most difficult market? He said, oh, young man. I said, he, I said oh, I'm sorry. That's a stupid question. It's, it's got to be the crash of 29. He said, oh, young man, that wasn't the worst. I said, what? He said, the early 60s. I said, but it went up. Right. He said, and it blew everybody away. All right. of us were saying the market's overbought. It's going to correct it. It never really Just did. Just kept going. And I right. never forgot that. In 1995, you look at the cover of my report that that was up 900 points without a correction. I went back and read every Wall Street Journal from beginning to end. In those days, I had to, <coughs> I had to go to the original papers, and the, the, the coughing with all the dust and everything. I went in the public library. Right. And that was the theme of the report. You know, we had then that we had in the early 60s, yeah. low inflation, low interest rates. And that was the theme of my report. So it was technical, made me do my homework, and I found out a fundamental reason for doing that. Interesting. Yes. And that... Uh, I, a lot of the clients were really upset that I wrote the report, but when I went to their office and I told them the story that I just told you, 
Best compliment you could ever give an analyst. One of the clients said to me, Ralph, I don't know if I believe it, but you gave me a lot to think about. Mm. And that guy had too many bonds in his portfolio. <laughs> so I think I bailed his butt out. It's funny. Sometimes charts provide the answer. Sometimes they help you figure out what yeah. you need to dig into. Yeah, a little bit that, well, that's, that's the problem we have. You know, we, yeah. we make a call. We don't have a specific reason for the call. Yeah. That happened to me in 1998. You know, I missed the Dow 7,000, then I raised it to 10,000. 10, but yep. on the way up in 1998, I got bearish. Yeah. And everybody was mad at me. Why are you getting bearish? And all of a sudden, I, 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 they were selling the big blue chip stocks. And I said, there's something wrong. Yeah. I didn't know why. Guess what? Three, three weeks later, Russian bond problem, and long-term capital went belly up. Mm. I was right, but I didn't have a reason. Yeah. And then I got bullish again at the end. But... Uh, yes, the point I'm making is that we see things. The market market reflects. Come on, it's a discounting mechanism. That's right. It That's anticipates right. the economy. Yeah. So I'm not an economist, but I like to follow the markets. Tell you what, one uh, you know, speaking of people you learned from, Alan Shaw was one of your mentors. Recently yes. passed away, unfortunately. Yes, we lost yes. the legend there. Uh, Can you, for those that did not know, have the pleasure of knowing yeah. Alan? Yeah. What did he mean to you? What did he mean to technical analysis? Oh, Alan Shaw, I. I said this to you earlier that uh, I don't know where technical analysis would be if it wasn't for Alan. And the mm -hmm. reason why I say this, I know people think I'm crazy, but in 1967, he started teaching at the New York Institute of Finance. Now, you got to understand, that was the school of Wall Street. If anybody wanted to do anything, yeah. uh, finance or marketing or whatever, you know, man money there, management, right? you went to that school. Yeah. And one of the classes he started teaching was technical analysis. And people like myself... Luis Yamada, John Murphy. I mean, I could list uh, Felix Zuloff and all these names that probably you never heard of. All were students of his. Wow. And, you know, and it was because of that that I started teaching in 1970 because I, I taught the basic class and Alan taught the, I did it on Monday night and Alan taught the advanced class on Tuesday night. I did that for 43 years. Wow. And I literally taught the street. I was on the floor of the stock exchange a couple of months ago and got, Guy comes up to me, hey, Ralph, you taught me 25 years ago. And, I, and I, another guy yells out, no, he taught me 30 years ago. I said, wow. And, but think of the impact that Alan Shaw had. There'd yes. be no Ralph Akapura. I don't know if there'd be a CMT organization. or Yeah, a CMT organization yeah. today. It was the market technicians in the beginning. Um, we have a lot to be thankful for. And, uh, it's true. He's a great guy. And he told me one thing, and I'll share it with everybody. Keep it simple. Mm. When looking at charts, keep it simple. The yeah. trend's your friend. Those are his quotes, you know. I think the, one of the ways we can honor someone like Alan, continuing to apply the discipline, continuing to analyze the markets, you are continuing to do so. Yes. I mean, you're still actively looking at the markets. Yes. When you look at the markets here in early 2024, I wonder if you would write a report today, what would that title be? Or what, you know, what sort of your sense of the conditions here now? Well, I, I, I got to go back to October 13, 2023. That was an intraday low that... And I've been looking at charts for a long time. I've never seen the Dow. That's when I think the Fed came out and 70, said 75 basis points. They were yeah. going to raise. The market dropped and rallied that day. It was a key reversal. That Dow had an, uh, an intraday high low of a 1,100 points. Huge. Yeah, it was 8%. Yeah. And yep. I, I, I just, it was like someone throwing a bucket of water on my head. I said, this is the bottom. Yeah. So I've been a secular bull since then, yeah. of course, looking for correction. And yeah. now I can't say we're in the early stages of it. But, hey, I, I'm a trend follower. I like what I see. But you know what's in interesting now? At that time, it was the big name stocks that led yes. most of that period. Yep. Now I'm starting to see it rotating. And I have a phrase, the lifeline of every bull market is rotation. Uh, and rotation okay. is taking place. I, I was just looking at some of my numbers this morning. Uh, uh, staples are coming. Consumer staples are starting yeah. to pop up again. Yeah. Financials, insurance stocks. Sure. Hey, take advantage of it. Yeah, I, I think the Magnificent Seven a little extended, and they're in nosebleed territory. Some of these charts, but I don't see major tops in them. So yeah, you know. still going up. Yeah. You mentioned things like uh, financials, even industrials, a number of yeah. these sectors that have been yes, underperforming, exactly. starting to work. Can you just uh, explain to people why is that important to see additional participation for some of well, these other groups that have been well, underperforming? As Alan used to tell me, when people take a profit, do they put that money in their pocket and go home? 
or do they look at and put it somewhere else in the market? And that's exactly what this happened. That money that's rotating out of some of the leaders is not leaving the market. It's finding areas that haven't participated, I'll say lower in price and lower in PE multiples. And that rotation is very healthy. That's long-term bullish stuff for me. We're certainly starting to see that. Ralph, such a pleasure to see you. Thanks, Thanks. so much for coming to visit us. Thanks for having me. Thanks for bringing some beautiful oh. artwork with you, and we oh, will no. take good care of it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. You guys are the best. Thanks. All right. We'll continue on with the show here in a moment. What a pleasure to be able to sit down with a, with a mentor of mine and uh, to many of us, Ralph Akampora. He did mention major low. That's the October 22 low. And I remember talking with Ralph soon after that. He pointed out his just a brilliant moment in market history, recent market history. Market selling off so consistently in October 2022, things looked so negative. I talked to Ralph and he said, yep, that day, like that big outside day really showed that there was something different. Something was changing. How right he was with a nice rally coming off of those lows, arguably continuing to uh, the market that we're seeing uh, now uh, this week and, uh, and going forward. And again, what a great uh, way to uh, remember the great Alan Shaw recently passing away. Rest in peace, Alan. Uh, so many of us, I think, learned from Alan or learned from so many who learned from Alan. His legacy, I think, will be felt for many, many decades to uh, come. Great conversation there with Ralph back and poor. We have to wrap the show, folks. We go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here's chart number one. You know, the mega cap leadership names, the Magnificent Seven, I would argue, are incredibly constructive or they're starting to show signs of weakness. It really depends on how you want to think of it. But I would like the charts to tell me what to think, right? We can always speculate about what may come next. Let's focus on the message of price. Now, when I think about those seven or eight mega cap leadership names, a lot of them making new highs and overbought, Microsoft's, uh, Alphabet's, Meta's having incredible runs. Apple is a bit of an outlier in that group, to be honest with you, in that it has not broken out. Netflix was one of those kind of leading names just finally breaking out. Apple, Tesla are sort of the other charts, right, that are just not quite as constructive. And recognizing when a group of stops, stocks look very homogenous, and then all of a sudden they start, one of them or two of them start to look a little different. That can tell you about changing sentiment and changing conditions. When I'm looking at the chart of Apple, I'm recognizing, I mean, it really looks in, in a lot of ways like a cup and handle pattern. We have this rally in the first half of 2023, this rounded bottoming pattern, breaking above trendline resistance in November. What a great signal coming out of that, uh, that new low in, uh, in late October. We broke above trendline resistance, continued to retest the previous highs, and that's been it. Apple has been unable to get above that $200 level, pulled back to the 200-day once again, retesting the July highs, essentially, and now failing to get there. Now, they're reporting earnings later this week, but I'd be very skeptical about upside for the broader market environment if big names, leading names like Apple, are not able to participate. We can debate whether we need small caps or not. But I would argue we definitely need the Apples and Metas and Alphabets doing well. Otherwise, our benchmarks just are not going to do well because of their weight uh, in the indexes. So pay attention to that. See if we're able to break out. And if not, this is at best a consolidating chart. And at worst, maybe starting to break down as the momentum certainly not looking constructive here as we uh, continue on this crucial week for the markets. Chart number two, looking at year-to-date returns. And I wanted to highlight that don't look now, but coming out of the October low of last year, so this is the October 23 low, if you look at the returns in three sectors, the top performing sector out of technology, financials, industrials, is technology. And that's certainly what I would assume. Tech is up about 26% uh, since that October low. But financials almost beating them out. And that's because technology stalled out a little bit here. Financials have just been ripping to the upside. So the financial sector almost outpacing technology since the, uh, the October low. So you can see financials up about 25%. Here's another sector, industrials, up 19% and, uh, you know, since that period. And if you look, look at the rotation that we've seen. Sectors like industrials sort of treading water end of December, beginning of January, while the technology uh, group leading higher. Now, all of a sudden, these other sectors, these value-oriented sectors starting to participate. Maybe this is that leadership rotation that Ralph was talking about in our discussion. And maybe that's where you find some opportunities ripe for the picking in some of those value-oriented sectors. You know, finally, JetBlue, we talked about a lot of earnings. Obviously, the mega cap earnings you need to pay attention to. Always pay attention to those big consumer tech communication names uh, and understand their weight in the indexes. But I'm inclined to look at some of the names maybe a little further down the cap tiers uh, in some of the other sectors. Here's JetBlue, right? One of, the, uh, one of the airline stocks. You can see the rotation from a sell-off in October to a rally in November, gapping higher 
right to that first Fibonacci retracement of around 38.2%. That was here in December. From there, we tested it a bunch of times and pulled back. Now we're kind of in this limbo between two moving averages, right? We have the 200-day moving average in Fibonacci resistance, the December high right there. On the downside, we have the 50-day moving average, the recent swing low from January. One of these is going to break, and I think charts like this with neutral momentum in a consolidation phase, wait to see where the chart tells you the momentum is heading, and often you want to follow that momentum. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Special thank you to Ralph Akampora, Brando Brembia joining us here uh, in our Redmond office, sharing some great uh, ideas, uh, market history, and also technical analysis wisdom. Don't forget to like our video, subscribe to our channel while we are here. For Stock Charts in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a good night. <laughs>